Well, this is the eighth and final chapter of the Gardner Brothers Mill. That was supposed to be a short project, but... Yeah, it was, uh, I originally thought it might take three weeks and a little fun project in the winter. Took the whole winter. Yep. And as a matter of fact, uh, the finishing touches were only put on it uh, about two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so into the spring. Anyway, there it is. And I think it turned out quite nice. Oh, I love it. It sits down here on the very bottom of what I've been calling the giant canyon because it's 11 feet deep. <laughs> And then the mill itself is also done a little bit smaller than the rest of the railroad. Not by much, but that's because uh, quite often what you're seeing here is looking down on it because it's actually sitting on the floor. Right, what well, is better known as a forced perspective. Exactly, and when we think forced perspective, we generally think looking up right. or back and away, but the same rules apply when you're looking down towards your feet. I guess that is what is referred to as floors perspective. <laughs> Which is appropriate because it is actually it's sitting on, the, on floor. the floor right next to your feet. <laughs> so even though the trestle itself here is four feet tall, having this smaller model down there makes it seem even taller than that. Right. Now, as we have mentioned in the past, the, the basic structure here started off as a little garden railroad fixture. It was made by Mountains in Minutes and it's a cast urethane mill. Right. One piece. Yes. And then we just kind of use that as a jumping off point and well it's it's uh, gotten a little more involved in that now. Well when did we ever not do that? <laughs> so the very first thing I did was construct the the understructure here. Uh, the base of it is a piece of foam core and then the rest of it is carved from extruded styrene insulation board which is what most of the railroad is actually made out of. I used a hot wire cutter to try to shape this to look sort of like giant boulders that had fallen down from above and were standing here in a big stack up against the side of the mill foundation. It's carved to fit neatly into this corner. It actually locks the mill up against the trestle. The, the trestle goes in first, then the mill keys into that and then this little piece keys into the mill, kind of holding the whole rest of the thing together. The electrical connections are behind here as well, along with the volume control for the sound system. So it, it also forms a, a cover over the electrical connections. So once I had it carved exactly to shape um, and figured out where I wanted the pine tree to be and so on, the next thing was to cover the whole thing up with colored sculpt mold to cover up all of the extruded uh, insulation board and foam core. So I covered up the floor and the side of the mill and the cliff and everything with blue painter's tape so that I could form my sculpt mold right up against it without gluing the whole thing in place with the sculpt mold because it is basically plaster and paper and wherever you put it, it's, it's gonna stay there forever. Now our friend Steve Stribble put me on to adding color to it before you mix it. I just put a little of this craft color in there and then add the water to it and mix it all up. And that way it, it has a, a good base coat of color already in place. Otherwise it just dries pure white. It does make it a bit of a mess. Right, and then you end up with what I refer to as hobby hands, dry, uh, dirt-caked fingernails and peely places. And, and you can't get it out. No. You know, you, you go to a, a social event and people are staring at you like, how come you got dirt up under your face? Yes. That's not dirt. Yes. That's craft material. It's craft material, yes. <laughs> Anyway, once the uh, pseudo mud uh, had set up, I was able to remove the whole section here and then peel up all of the blue painter's tape and uh, set it back in place to make sure everything was in proper alignment. Once the sculpt mold was completely set up, I was able to remove this whole section over to the workbench to do a lot of the painting and work on it over here at the workbench. Well, I prefer to work at the workbench when possible. It's just easier on the back and the legs, and, and you can see what you're doing much better. 
Yeah, I, my knees are still trying to recover from this mill project. Oh, being down on a cement floor, wow. Yes, yeah, so much of this, I mean, it's hard enough working on a model railroad that's at bench level. At floor level, it's just, well, it's right out. Right. So a lot of the color in the whole canyon are these sample jars that we picked up at Home Depot of bare home latex paint. Anyway, I started painting that directly over the foam uh, without even adding any texture. Just put in the latex paint directly on the extruded styrene. Well, once you get that all completed, it really does look like rock. Yeah, that, uh, well, the pink color doesn't really. Yeah. Yeah, so once you get some proper color on top of that styrofoam, or styrene, it isn't actually styrofoam. Anyway, boy, it just, it comes right to life. I love it. And then, of course, a lot of what I'm doing here involves adding in some more uh, sculpt mold uh -huh. and, and more color. And you just, I, my philosophy on these things is you just keep moving things around and when it looks right, then you stop. Yes, stop right there. Don't go any further. <laughs> And uh, although my knees protesteth, a lot of this still has to be done with it in place on the floor because it has to tie into the existing scenery. And getting the colors just right, well, there's, there's just no getting around it. You have to do it in the actual canyon. I've become a little bit of a fanatic about moss. Uh-huh. I, I think that when you're doing a gooey, wet environment like this, there has to be mossy colors in the rock. Absolutely. And so down here at the river's level, I'm mixing in all kinds of green, and I think that really brings it to life. It sure does. Now the process that I usually follow, uh, nothing set in stone, or in this case mud, <laughs> <laughs> um, is I put down some really, I put down some basic color and then gooey, gooey wet coats. I just work more and more wet color down into those colors because I want to get the the really wet stuff down into the cracks yeah and uh, make sure that everything is neatly filled in with color working toward more and more washes if you will more and more dilute paint so that the, the color really gets down into the cracks well, it looks to me that really wet stuff, it looks like mud and moss and I can almost smell the vegetation. And it's it's inspiring when, when this dries, then it all turns kind of satin flat colors. But I try to remember what it looked like when it was wet because I want to return to this. Yes. So then I come back and add in some glossy stuff over the top because I want it to look wet and muddy down here. Right. Now look, I'm really applying a thin wash here. I've really, really diluted down the color and uh, because I really want that darker color to soak down into the cracks. Right, that adds depth. And then once that has dried, I like to come back with lighter colors working toward lighter and lighter as I go. And in this case, you see, I'm trying to get the paint out of the brush so that it's a drier brush, and then bring that drier brush over the top of everything lightly to add these lighter colors, almost like highlights. Exactly. And uh, you can see here, I'm just adding some of this really light, dusty color on top of the existing, and I'll just keep going lighter and lighter and uh, the key here again is knowing when to stop. Exactly. <laughs> but I, when I get carried away, which is pretty much all uh, the time, then I'll, I'll do another wash. And that'll kind of darken it back up and bring out the, the cracks in the rock again and then come back with yet, yet again more dry brushing. I see. And even here where I've put the color directly over the extruded foam insulation, Getting that, that dark color down in the cracks and the lighter colors onto the highlights, boy, that looks nice. It sure does. Now you can see here I've applied some uh, glossy decoupage along where I wanted it to stay muddy. Mm -hmm. And it's brought back that glossy color. And then notice I'm using your cactails. Yes! <laughs> you, you whipped up a whole bunch of these cactails a while back. Those were fun. And uh, what better thing to have along a mossy, swampy riverbank than cactails? Absolutely. 
So I, I put them just here and there. Don't get too carried away with it, but that just really looks nice. It does. And uh, speaking of water effects and mud and so on, uh, once I started putting that glossy uh, Mod Podge over the muddy areas, the whole river here, the whole output, well, I don't know what you would call that, but the stream that comes out of the mill wheel all has to be done in a really wet environment as though there's flowing water coming down that channel. Exactly. And we've taken a lot of inspiration here from the site of Robert Gardner's actual mill. Uh -huh. And uh, as I look at the river bank and the river and the flowing water and the vegetation, that's the look right yes. there. Inspirational. And then when we actually paint in the water on the floor, that's the look I want. That's the same color for the water. And uh, boy, if we could figure out a way to pick up that reflection like that too. But if it's glossy enough, I it think it should, will. It yeah. should, yeah. And again, as we're putting down the, the uh, sculpt -a mold I'm putting color in over the top of it and keeping everything just really gooey, sloppy, wet, and then mixing in some of that really glossy Mod Podge. And where the Mod Podge is, it does dry glossy and it keeps that wet look. Oh, good. And I think it, I think that does look like the riverbank. Oh, it sure does. And it wouldn't be much of a riverbank without a lot of vegetation. Right. When we were looking at those pictures from uh, Gardner's Mill, that's the thing that really is that it's just covered with branches and growth and plants of all kind. Very green. And where we do make some of our own vegetation like your cattails, most of what we're using are just commercially available products. Yes. These are these little clumps of grass with roots. Uh, I got them from a group of people who do military dioramas in Great Britain. But the, the cool thing here is figuring out how they were made. They're, they actually use this brown stuffing material that's supposed to be used for upholstering chairs. <laughs> anyway, uh, then you apply a little dirt over the top of a thin layer of that and then static grass on top of that. And boy, can you come up with some neat little tufts of grass. You can pull out some of that stuffing material and let some of the dirt that's on top of that sort of sift down through the whole thing. And uh, gee, it looks so much like, like a tuft of grass with exposed roots. And these are those uh, river stones. Right. We bought these at Walmart. Right. They were in the plant department. Yes, down where they have the artificial plants and craft supplies. And it was a huge plastic bag of them. I'm looking at those going, those are just the right size and shape for river stones on the railroad. And we ended up with like a 10 pound bag of these that's going to last a lifetime. <laughs> anyway, I went ahead and put about, a, I don't know, half a handful of them in various strategic locations around the, the scene here in the river where the water's flowing out of the mill wheel and also along the river bank. And then here's one of my favorite techniques, uh, weeds. <laughs> So uh, the upside about using weeds as a root system uh, for doing exposed roots is it gets rid of the weeds in the yard. Yes, that's one good part. And it looks great. Yeah, it stays looking great too. So I'll go out and pick like 30 weeds and throw 29 of them away and keep one of them that's got just the right texture and shape and just the right amount of dirt still stuck to the roots and stick that on the railroad to look like some exposed roots. Right. Nothing looks like exposed roots like exposed roots. This is true. <laughs> and nothing looks like dirt more than dirt. So use it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the way we secure all this stuff in place is the old standby dilute white glue. Yes, that always works. And then it's sort of similar to dilute white glue, but all of the glossy stuff here is Mod Podge. Right. You use a lot of Mod Podge. Oh, I sure do. It works really well on a lot of things. And I, I've been using it more and more all the time, but that this, all of the glossy stuff here on the mill is Mod Podge. And then I bought a bottle of this. It's, it's a Mod Podge, but it's not the usual stuff we use. It's called Super Gloss. Yes, this is different. It's thick. Yes. And so you can see here as I'm daubing it in there, you can actually pull it up into little peaks and so on. 
because it's that thick. It goes on really white. I mean, all Mod Podge does, but this stuff really stays white and, and foggy for quite some time. It takes a long time to dry because it, it really is a thick coating on there. And then with both Mod Podges, the Super Gloss, this thick stuff, as well as the regular Mod Podge, I found that What's you that? almost always have to come back and add oh, a second yeah. coat. It right, like just it, to be sure. Yeah, because it, it'll so dry glossy in some places, but then maybe not so much. And so uh, another coat or two on top of there until you get the exact look you want. And this little section here where the water is cascading down into the river, that's like five coats on there. Yes. I just could not get the look. It would dry and there would, it just didn't have the right look. I think it just took more layers to make it work. Eventually it did, but yeah, it, it, that's like five, five layers. Wow. And then it also took like three days to completely dry. It still had a white creamy look and I was afraid it was gonna stay that way. Oh, frothing water. <laughs> But all of it finally did turn completely clear. And then, as we've mentioned on other projects where we're doing water, it's really key to not get the, the water effect on top of the areas that you want dry. Exactly. And so what I find myself doing, because it's difficult to not get some spilled around, if mm. you will, I'll come back with a flat clear. Okay. And just daub flat paint on top of the rocks and stuff so that they look dry. Right. I tried uh, using the, the thick Mod Podge here to do the splashing effect under the mill wheel and I just couldn't pull up peaks quite as tall as I wanted to. Yes. And so I we got some of this at Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a clear caulk. Right. And it's not the silicone caulk. I don't know if it's an acrylic or what it is. It's water soluble. Oh. Much easier to work with. And, and look at that. It looks great. Look at great. the results. That's awesome. It always comes out looking, of course, like a still picture. Yes. Everything else is moving, but your water is neat. <laughs> well, except for when the lights hit it certain ways from above, and you can see it almost looks like it is moving to me. Yeah, and, and I, one way or the other, it's a model railroad, and there's always going to be that interesting sort of compromise between like your figures being completely frozen in place and your water being kind of static and so on, and then other parts of it moving. Right, I, you know what, I probably have a really active imagination then. Yeah, well, and I wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> and then uh, we needed to add some vegetation over here on the little uh, section off to the left of the mill, the new section. So a couple of these little pine trees that I carved up out of those little bottle burst trees. <laughs> Got some of those off Amazon, and then I just reshaped them with some scissors and color and so on. And I think they look fine. They look great. For basic bottle brush trees. Right. And then I went out in the yard and did a little more weeding. And I found this root after pulling up a half a dozen weeds. And after clearing the dirt off of here, yeah, this seemed to be just the exact right root for the pine tree. Right. To have some exposed roots coming out down at the riverbank. As soon as I got the dirt cleaned off of this, I applied a little bit of the super glue down at the base end of it just to hold it all together because <laughs> it, was, it was trying to fall apart. Oh dear. And then I buried that end under, of course, real live honest. This is gopher dirt. Gopher dirt. Yeah, but we have everything broken out by different colors and stuff. We call this one gopher dirt. But I put the gopher dirt around the tree with just some of the weed roots sticking out. I, I think that turns out quite nice. It really looks like a, a tree root sticking out along the riverbank. And now the crown jewel. Uh, I always wanted to have a boat tied up at the dock. And I thought, you know, spring is coming. I want to work outside on the railroad. The boat will wait till next winter. So uh, I've got this, this hull for the boat. And I thought, well, that can make a nice form to build a boat around later on. And I was showing this to Steve saying, I, I want to use your technique for building a paper boat around this this form. And he was looking at it going, yeah, well, yeah, well. and so he just built a boat. Isn't that something? <laughs> he, he's built so many amazing things for the railroad here. 
and uh, now he's built this great little boat to have tied up at the Gardner Brothers Mills boat dock. That is just amazing. Last year he built this great windmill. It's all built from scratch, brass parts and wood, but 100% scratch. That is so neat. It's, it just turned out so amazing. I love it. And then he, he built these uh, log buggies for the logging railroad. Those are cool. They're awesome. Hartford product kit, and then he put that together. And then this truck. This has got to be my most favorite. He, he cobbled together a couple of different kits and, and some scratch building and one thing and another and built that truck. Yes. And what a great little junkyard dog that truck is. And now this boat. That is so awesome. I'm just tickled pink. And he, he talked about using his same technique where he builds a boat out of paper, layered paper, but a boat of this size, he said, no, nah, it just needs to be built entirely out of wood. Right, a very thin wood to be appropriate, but hey, look at it. It turned out so great, and it's just, it's built exactly the way you would build a little boat like this out of plank wood, and uh, uh, it just, it completely blows my mind. It always surprises me what Steve can come up with. I mean, the man has talent everywhere. And it's an inspiration. Oh, yeah. Every time he builds something, then I'm looking at what I'm doing going, well, I got up my game. Right. But, you know, it's like, yeah, that, that, isn't that exactly what's supposed to happen is you see your friends work and it just makes you want to do even better? Oh, I, that's why I wanted to try making us like uh, structures and things like that for the railroad. It's just a lot of fun. And the size and the colors and everything, it just ties right in and looks absolutely perfect tied up there at the dock. It sure does. And as it happens, that was the very, very last thing that was needed for the mill. And it's just so complete. So it, it really is the, the crown jewel. Yes. The, the maraschino cherry on the... On the, the bottom? bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just... Anyway, there it is. There, the, yeah. the mill is finished. The boat is finished. Uh, everything ties together. I love it with the, the huge trestle there. And I'm so glad that I added this little bit of terrain off to the left with uh, one of Al's pine trees over here. It's just, like I say, it was supposed to be a little three-week project. And it got away from us. There is no such thing as a little three-week anything, except maybe a vacation and it's over with in a hurry. Anyway, summer is here and we're back working outside on the railroad. So when next we pick up projects, we'll be working out there. Yes. But we're just, <laughs> it's so cool to see this finished and all in place. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this series on the Gardner Brothers Mill, and there's so much more here on the channel. So if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. And the easy, easy peasy way to subscribe is by clicking on the upcoming blue button. Zoink! Right there. The blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Tuesday. Right. We'll see ya. We'll see ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.